And I'd like to hand over to Peter to tell us about uh, this very exciting workshop. So, hello, hello. Um, good, good, good evening for those in the UK. Good morning to everybody else. I've just made a mistake here and clicked off my, uh, okay. I had a second monitor in which I was making sure that things were coming across and I've just switched it off by accident. Right, um, we, we, live, we live in a changing world. We live in a world where things keep on changing faster and faster, even though the rate of uh, innovation is currently decelerating. So not that we are less, but we are increasing more slowly. But it's important, whatever business you are in, to have innovation in place, to have a continuous focus on finding new solutions, new things to do. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. I am going to be using a few different tools uh, this evening. So PowerPoint slides, as you can see, that's the first one. I'm going to use two tools for interaction. The first one is Menti, which allows to ask a few questions and answer a few. Uh, second one towards the second half of the um, workshop will be the Miro. Uh, tool, which is basically an interactive giant whiteboard in which I'm going to ask you to capture your ideas, your objectives, and so on. Um, so the Miro, I would strongly recommend you access it on a laptop. Menti works okay on a telephone. Uh, we'll start straight away with the uh, Menti tool. So. Uh, you can scan the QR code, which is on the screen, or you can go to menti.com and enter the code 23347260, or you can click on the link that I've just put in the chat. That will bring you to uh, an application for those of you who don't know it. It's got, I'll uh, be able to ask questions, get some immediate feedback. You will also be able to ask questions on it or make comments, which I will be able to see. So I'll start off with a fairly straightforward question, which is, where are you today? So the first screen when you open up Menti gives you a map, there's a dot. You can place the dot on your location. I increased the size of the UK as I'm assuming most participants this evening are in the UK. But if you come from elsewhere in the world, good on you, let's find out. So, oh, and, um, Remember to hit the submit button. Oh, there, nobody was in Bournemouth and I've got three people down on the south coast there. And one way up north, still in England. Nobody from Scotland or Wales. Somebody in Spain, that's good. Got a little bit of internationalism. So at the end, after the... Um, questions at the end of this presentation, I will be sharing the screen, the, um, um, the slides with you. And that will include all the Q&A slides, all the mentee slides. So once you've indicated where you are, my next question would be, what is your role? You've got possibility of giving me three different aspects there. So you can mention that you are uh, your title as well as your main role or what you're responsible for, different ways of doing it. Um, Director of Innovation. Oh, good. We've got one of those. Somebody's role is London. That's, um, I'm assuming that was an answer to the previous question. Anything's coming up. 
treasurer, tech lead, innovation, business, software engineers, architect seems to be the main one. We seem to have a lot of architects, uh, consultants, retired. Always nice that somebody who's retired is interested in innovation. So moving on, if I come back to sharing my slide, there it is. Okay. You've got a number of things when we're talking about innovation that are critically important. And the four main ones, as far as I'm concerned, are curiosity, creativity, intuition, and imagination. And apart from curiosity, they tend, the three others, tend to be discouraged as soon as you get into the schooling system or into work. You're told that you need to focus more on facts, data, and number, and not trust your intuition or your imagination. Curiosity is sometimes still encouraged, but most companies find that uh, curiosity, innovation, creativity are largely discouraged because we want to continue doing things the way we are. We tend to stifle innovation. There is a strong push towards standardization and process and compliance, and we are losing something important. And I'd like to talk about how we can overcome some of that. But before I go any further, I need to ask you what your expectations are. So I'm going to go back to Menti here and find out what your expectations are for today, today's session. So this is a free share. I'm not getting many answers. Techniques to encourage, yes, ideas, that's very generic. Learn something new about cultivating innovation, sharing of ideas, something new and interesting. Now there's a challenge. Um, just keep up with what current thinking is about, ideas, inspiration, okay. Think, learn how to encourage innovation and how to move people to shift fixed positions. Shake people out of their habitual ways of thinking, yes. Understand how to get a culture of innovation, always keen to learn more, good, good, good. So, moving on. The dilemma we are facing is that when I say innovation, most business schools identify this as something which is fairly quick and drastic. Um, dramatic turnaround over a very short period of time. But when I'm talking about culture, we're talking about something that is very slow and demands participation of all kinds of people. And the challenge you're going to have if you want to change the culture and promote something is that you need people to participate, but they will only participate if the culture encourages them to participate. So this is one of the challenges you have. Obviously, the other challenge is trying to persuade people of the need to change. Uh, Aristotle defined the three artistic proofs to change and to motivate people. And that is, you need to have the credibility, the person promoting, recommending it has to be credible. The people who need to do the work need to want to accept and implement the change. So there's an emotional side there and you need facts, data, rationale in order to make it happen. In addition to Aristotle's three, there's a fourth one that needs to be added down, which is Kairos, 
which is getting this done at the right moment. Obviously, if it's the wrong moment, it's not going to happen. So this evening, I'm going to go through some principles of change, um, understanding the cultural ecosystem, identifying the right people to participate in this, balancing creativity and business continuity needs, baselining the culture, understanding the constraints of culture change, planning and designing the change process. We start with some basic principles of change and analysis. So the traditional Western approach is analytical deconstructionism in which we break everything down to components. It's the basis of what we call system thinking. I break everything down into components. If every component works, then the whole system will certainly work. It's a bit like the surgeon who tells you that your heart is in perfect working order, your liver, kidneys, lungs are all in perfect working order. The only reason you're dead is because the surgeon removed them to analyze them. Western thinking was very strongly influenced by Newton and Newtonian physics, which established uh, immutable mathematical principles and laws that guide things, which is a new concept, unchanging laws of the universe. But unfortunately, uh, Newton tended to include the Christian understanding of divine creation and design in his laws, which could be challenged and was challenged as we came up with the Darwinian evolution aspect, which said, you know, change is based on random changes. And it's just things happen completely randomly. Some things are good and attractive and stay in place. Some things are bad, we don't like them and they get eliminated. Most developments are wasted and only a few succeed. This was made more complex by Max Planck and Albert Einstein as they built up the principles of quantum physics um, which demonstrated that life is both a wave and a particle, which you cannot see, and it can be two things at the same time, just like people can believe in two completely contradictory thoughts at the same time. This all comes together in the concept of ecosystems, which tend to work in the opposite way to the uh, deconstructivism approach. So the idea of an ecosystem is that every component is dependent on the whole thing working together. So the components only work because the system works. If you change a component, it will impact the system, which will impact the other components. For example, um, some 25 years ago, um, the Yellowstone National Park introduced wolves, which meant that the deers could not continuously graze the same spot anymore, which allowed trees to grow, which brought back sung birds and beavers and all kinds of animals, who changed the course of rivers, dropped the temperature of water as they started having the rivers going through woods rather than through open spaces, and all in all, establish a change that has been estimated to be worth $35 million in extra revenue today compared to the $30 million that were invested originally. This is important because culture is an ecosystem. Society, culture, collectivity, is not so much a group of individuals, but it is a group of relationships. It is a group of interactions. So we defined not so much by who we are, but about our communication channels, our contacts and other aspects. And even the human being alone, you have to know that approximately half of the human genome is uh, some kind of bacterial infection originally. 
And today they are probably at least 30% more bacterial cells in your body than they are human cells. And that is the amount which is normally estimated for a fit, healthy person. So 30% more bacterial cells than human cells. You are a society, you are a culture of relationships between all these elements. And this is what makes you very unique. You are a unique combination of your past, your ancestry, your education, and every experience that you have. This makes you completely unique and gives you the skill, the opportunity to see and understand a combination of things that nobody else sees and understands the same way. You have got relationships to the outside worlds, to your knowledge, to your understanding of things that are completely unique to you. And when we bring this up into a team, if we want a creative team, we have to find those areas of entanglement where two different levels of understanding cross over. Two completely different aspects meet up and together make create something completely new. If you don't encourage creativity and innovation in your organization, you are expecting your job to die down, to be taken over by artificial intelligence or robotics, and to be seen as a boring old workplace by the brightest young people coming into your business. If you don't promote this, if you don't make it happen, you will lose sight of these interactions, you will lose sight of these overlaps, and you will not have a team per se, but you will have a group of people who happen to be working on the same thing at the same time. So if you want to change the culture, if you actually want to influence it somehow, You've got to consider everything else that we would normally consider in change management. So we need vision and design and communication and strategy and all these things. But most important, we need an influence of psychology and sociology. If you don't have the understanding of psychology and sociology and try to force a change, you are going to start losing more than you gain. So you're going to make something which is more complicated than expected, or at least it looks complicated. You're going to break relationships. You are going to discourage and lose key players. So you risk by changing things without applying the proper tools, creating more problems and losing more than you gain. So that has to be understood because the relationships between these people, the visions they have, the understanding, the knowledge that they have is the wisdom of the group. And the wisdom is that cultural knowledge that allows individuals to react rapidly and efficiently to unforeseen events. So I want the wisdom to be there so that I can react as a team member correctly when something unexpected happened, but I want the team to react correctly at the same time. And the wisdom is something like the culture that is built up over a long period of time. It is largely something that comes from below rather than from above. And the idea is that I need to get this under control if I am going to be successful. So the next question is, what would you think are the critical things that you would need to change in order to be successful? What are the things that you believe you should be prioritizing in order to achieve good improvements? So I'm back on my Menti slides here. And I've got a few answers already. 
do you believe that you should be um, focusing on the am I sharing this am I sure I'm sharing it yes okay um, oops sorry didn't mean to do that that's where I want to be make a move experienced people more available, uh, implement and orga oops, organize informal discussions and brainstorming sessions. Yes, good idea. Implement and organize document knowledge repository. Send staff regularly to conferences and workshops. Absolutely. A few people here have said other. Would you like to unmute yourself and tell me what the other is? So whoever has said other, if you can just briefly unmute yourself and tell us what you meant by other. No, okay. Then I will continue moving on. Um, the risk we run when trying to change the culture is understanding that we've got number of advantages and disadvantages to the existing culture, whatever it is. So generally we can talk about loose cultures and tight cultures. Loose cultures give people a lot of freedom, whistleblowing is discouraged, tight cultures are um, very structured and whistleblowing is encouraged. So if someone's not following the party line, we tend to do it. They both have advantages. So tight culture nations, we're very quick to lock down and stop the spread of the pandemic in the past year. On the other side, the loose cultures, which encourage free thinking and generally an open mind, we're much quicker to develop vaccines. There are other aspects of culture that can be considered. Herst Hofstadter, uh, gives six dimensions to national cultures, which uh, are you, is the individual more important than the community? How far is communication? How difficult is communication between the leader and the base? What is the masculine feminine approach? Are men encouraged to show their emotions and to cry and to take paternity leave or should they be providing and big boys don't cry and all this? Uncertainty avoidance, are strange things a danger or a curiosity? Long-term orientation, do you continuously adapt for the future or do you respect traditions? Do you tend to tolerate or enforce rules and principles? And Herr Hofstadter demonstrates this by putting various nations on these um, ranks between it. As most people on this call are in the UK, for information purposes, this is where the UK tends to lie according to his concepts. So if I want to change and it's based on people, I need to understand where things are. I'm going to have to identify where are the key knowledge points? Where are the people who know things? Where are the people who will be able to help me and to identify the good people who know a lot as well as the question marks of people who don't know a lot. So uh, a quick question here. How easy is it for you to find the knowledge you need when something happens that you were not expecting? I'm going to use a poll here. So I've got two questions. How easy is it for you to find the right answer at work when something surprises you? How good are you at recognizing the skills and competencies of your colleagues? 
and you get to say this is easy, difficult, impossible. Um, okay. Seven, 11 people so far. 11, um, I've got 26 people apparently here, 11 have responded. I'm going to wait for two more so that I've got a 50% mark. They're not coming. Okay, I will share the results then. So these are the results that um, were shown. Kind of okay. Um, one person finds it easy and one person finds it almost impossible. Recognizing the skills and competencies of your colleagues, okay. Um, I'm glad nobody answered. I didn't know I had competent colleagues. That's a good thing. So you need to try to understand this. You need to try to identify who are the people who know things within your organization so that you can then start working on identifying a little bit more on this topic, which is how well do you feel you understand your team members? So it's a similar question. There's a slightly more in detail. So understanding interest, experience, and knowledge of your team members uh, seems to have a high score, seven, with only three respondents so far. Um, where to go? That's good. There seems to be some level of communication here. Uh, what the market needs beyond what they say they want seems to be a problem area. It's a negative area. And the management's true priorities and goals seems to be questionable. I'm always amazed about this. I go into organizations and ask them what their vision is for the future, ask senior management where they're going, why are people going to come here in five years' time? And mostly they don't know. They just believe that the work is going to stay the way it is. So you need to understand this because you need to start being able to identify the key people within your company. Creativity requires exploration, thinking creatively, willingness to share and willingness to listen. Um, in my book, Orchestrated Knowledge, quick plug there, I have a chapter praising the benefits of a messy desk. Because if a clean desk is something that uh, an engineering requirement, the messy desk is a creativity requirement. Putting things together that couldn't belong together and suddenly make sense. But creativity is just having an original idea. That's not enough. In order to translate that into innovation, you need to have the ability to change ideas into action. So identifying creative people, in my opinion, I am looking for three characteristics of uh, innovative or creative people. They should be curious, wanting to discover new things. They should be engaged, willing to share their discoveries and ideas, willing to speak up, against common knowledge, propose different solutions, and they need to be integrated, respected by their team. People listen to them, but they are integrated and will accept and support the team's decision in the end. In order to identify these people, we need some kind of personality test. Uh, there are a number of them there. I like a test which is called the big five. The idea behind the big five is that it measures your skills in a number of different areas. It doesn't put you in a box. It gives you a ranking from zero to 100. 
and you identify this is an area where I need to focus more attention or this is something that I'm good at. Each one of the five areas is broken down into three sub areas and nobody really should score zero or 100% on anything. If you, it's a lot more subtle than that and it will change over time. If you score zero or 100, you're probably a psychopath in some way. So just avoid those scores. I've then grouped them back in according to curious, engaged and integrated. So I've reorganized the 15 different characteristics and I can then add them up and give a score. So I can say, for instance, I've got two staff here, members here who have filled out the task, that filled out the questionnaires, and these are their scores. What would you think seeing these scores would be a good job for these people? Um, so I'm going to open up the poll again. How would, oops, stop sharing, relaunch poll. Okay. Looking at the scores of Anna and Bob, where do you think they would be best fitted? So the last time I did this, the main responses came to exactly what I was going to recommend, which pleased me that I must be somewhere in the right direction. So the scores are busy coming up. And okay, eight respondents, nine. Okay, I've passed the halfway mark, so I'm happy with that. And I will share the results. So for Anna, you believe she would be a good manager or team leader. Team leader comes first with 71%, manager comes second, auditor comes third, and Bob, 71% designer or architect and very little probability of becoming a manager. So if I stop sharing, and I think you need to close the window if you want to get rid of it. I suggested and are well integrated with 345. Indeed, good manager or team leader, not very curious. Bob, on the other hand, is very curious, but not very engaged with the team. So he needs probably to have a more solitary job like architect or designer. Um, the poll is there, the, the options are there, the, the tool is there, it is readily available. Um, I've again lost my... Uh, Message board, where is message chat there? That's the one I'm looking for. So I will add the link in the chat. Okay, so you can do this. You can access it, uh, it's free. Try to be reasonably uh, objective when you do it, but we all would like to be a bit better. I do in companies something which I call the um, organizational therapy sessions. And the idea behind organizational therapy is understanding what management's point of view on something is and how can I then, how is that understood and put into practice by different individuals? 
And so the idea here is to see how well it is understood and it allows me to establish some uh, relationships, some analysis of the results that are coming out of the questionnaires and the interviews. And I will come up with a graph like this one, which is not showing up. Okay, let's try and wake this up. There we are. Okay, so if I look at this graph, I can look at the right side of my spider chart and see generally a good attitude within the teams, okay? People feel they can express their opinion, they are being listened to, they are respected. That's a good thing. On the left side, I'm seeing that there are some problems that uh, communication problems that we find that is people don't have the appropriate level of access to the information they need to do their work. They feel they don't have the access to the tools that they need. They don't have clear priorities and don't really participate in changing those priorities. So I probably need to work on management communication within here and help management understand that they need to spend more time listening to the needs of their team members and more time communicating things such as priorities, objectives, and so on, and why they change. A second graph that I get out of this is one that looks like this, my little bubble chart. So the higher up the bubble is, so each bubble here represents one person. It's done by numbers because I want it to be anonymous. The person who filled out the questionnaire knows what number they have and are free to speak up if they want to. So the higher you are on here, the more integrated you are in the team. In other words, the more you are willing to listen, to participate, uh, to be heard. Uh, the engagement level is the further right you are. And the bigger the bubble is, the more curious you are and the more you want to um, discover new things, new solutions, new way of doing things. And you can see in the bottom left, there is one large greenish uh, bubble there of someone who has obviously got a lot of imagination, a lot of curiosity, but doesn't share and when they do share, isn't listened to. In the top right hand corner, we have got a cluster of identical sized and very close range things. This is fairly typical due to a homophilic approach to hiring and team building. So in a typical team, if as an individual, I compare everything there is to know about a topic and what I know about it, I have to come to the conclusion that actually I only know a small piece of it. Now, when we are hiring and building teams using our natural tendency for homophily, I'm going to look for people who fit into the team. In other words, people who have the same background, the same education, the same type of experience. And I end up with a team that still has very little coverage of the knowledge that's out there, but has an awful lot of redundant knowledge on which they already agree. Instead of that, if you create a team of rebels, you're going to spread out that knowledge. It's probably more difficult to reach an agreement and consensus, but you'll have a more spread out knowledge of people who know and have experienced different things and have a different past. Of course, over time, you do run the risk that the team assimilates and comes back to being a single entity. Putting in place a team of rebels works. This is something which is uh, promoted by Reed Hastings, who is the founder and CEO of Netflix, who says when you want, if you've got an idea, if you want to do something, you can go ahead and do it. You're free to make your own choices. However, 
find out, get feedback, get to people with different perspectives, different levels of awareness, get to know the options. Erin Meyer, who is uh, one of the better known international culture specialists, uh, helped him write this book and gave her opinion on what was doing it as an outsider. I'm also pointing out here briefly, by the way, the Tech Talent Charter, the Tech Talent Charter, which is a um, British organization that encourages the hiring of people who are um, of different experience. So it encourages people to be, um, encourages, uh, the hiring of women, of minorities, and so on. So, having rebels, good idea. However, I now need to align them. I need to bring them together. I need to identify, get, make sure that the creativity is focused on the business. I need people to be winners because they are helping the team win and everyone has different roles. I'm a big supporter of SOFIA, the SFIA, which is uh, created by BCS um, and which helps to identify the skills, the experience of individuals, as well as the skills, responsibilities necessary for various roles helping you to focus on career plans, finding the best person for a job and so on. And of course, I am also going to uh, plug my own principles here of uh, Vitruvian quality. Uh, Vitruvian quality is based on some basic principles that were laid out by Vitruvius many years ago and which promote a clear structure to your organization in which your mission statement is at the heart of your organization. It's the foundation. What is it you're actually trying to do? And it is reflected in the visions, the policies and the strategy, but also in the education, the communication, the culture of the organization. So we need to get these things aligned and we need to get them aligned all the way through the business down to the tasks and procedures. I need to know how what I am doing today helps move us towards our vision statement and satisfy our mission. I will be giving a talk on this uh, same channel in October. So in October, there is a talk being organized by Imo, Margaret and the rest um, on Vitruvian quality, where I'll explain more about this and why it's called Vitruvian and so on. So I'll skip over that for now. So what about your level of responsibility? Do you feel that you have the job, the right job for your skills? Do you think you are overqualified, underqualified, or does basically nobody know what the heck it is you're doing or why? So I've got 27%. Uh, no one has ever defined what are the skills. 17% don't know what the skills they should have are. And 21% oh, good, it's jumped up that people believe they've got the skills necessary to do their work. That would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Um, Five percent believe that we always hire and assign people based on a clear match between their skills and experience available. That is a good thing. Those are companies that I would really like to be working in. Um, Okay, as I said earlier on, the results of these will be included in the handouts that will be sent out after this presentation. So we're going to try to make it happen now. 
Um, I am not going to be using Menti again, except at the end to check if there are any questions that are still outstanding. Um, we need to try to get people to do things. So you need to provide them the opportunity to make mistakes. Um, you need to provide, help people do it, give them the chance to learn. What's well, another one of the Netflix um, concepts, which is in the book, the, the No Rules Rules. And that is, if you have a brilliant idea, go ahead and do it. And if it's successful and moves the company forwards, great. If it is not successful, then I expect you to come and give a presentation as to what are the lessons you learned from this failure. So it's a complete, very positive attitude to all this, uh, encouraging you to do the right thing to achieve the right results. It's not easy. Um, I'm going to refer here to the Kinefin um, framework, which was developed by uh, Cognitive Edge and by, uh, oh God, I've forgotten his name now. Dave, oh, okay, never mind. Cognitive Edge. Um, this is not a solution. This is saying, when you come across a problem, it falls into some various categories and you need to understand which category it is in order to help you decide what's the right approach. So you've got fixed constraints. This is an obvious question. You know this problem, you've solved it before. You can know exactly where it belongs. You can categorize it, you can respond to it and you can solve it fairly straightforward. Complicated is a lot more difficult. Here we've got governing constraints. So I don't know why this problem happened, but retroactively, I can look back and I might need to get a consultant or a specialist in to understand this, to understand what actually happened and go back and see how we can respond to it. Complex situations are worse than that because we don't know why they happened. And when you look back, you cannot identify these are the things that caused it to happen. You, are, you may, can identify some of the reasons that allowed this to happen. So they didn't cause it, they allowed it. This is where you need to start thinking up new ways of doing things, new ways of responding. And then of course, you've got the chaotic things where there's no reason for this to have happened. There's no cause, it's just sometimes stuff happens and you need a completely new approach. So understanding the constraints allows you to put it in one of the four quadrants of the model and by that identify what would be recommended as the right approach. And so if I'm talking about um, changing culture and basically transformation of culture, where would you place this? What would be your spontaneous thought? Okay, got uh, 14 responses. Quickly a few more before I close it. Okay, I'm going to stop it there and share the results with you. So most of you believe that it is complex, a few believe it is complicated or chaotic, and one thinks it's obvious. So. Personally, I would say that it is uh, it is uh, complex. 
because we have enabling constraints, you react, you decide things based on your past, based on your experience. That does not cause the reaction. Machines may be complicated. If I take a Lamborghini and break it up into its components, someone with the right level of knowledge would be able to put it back together. Humans are complex and they're a lot more difficult to change things. Um, of course, some humans are chaotic and it's best to leave those alone. But what is important out of this is that it allows us to understand that system thinking is probably not going to work if we are talking about a complex environment. We need to implement complexity thinking in which we are continuously measuring this current state and what direction we should go in next. Okay, placing the right information in front of the right person at the right time only works on very few people. And I would say usually people who are on the autism spectrum somewhere and who believe that if that is what you say is the way to do it, it is the way to do it. Most people will react, will resist, and some of them will be cynical and will try to contradict you and stop you at every step of the way. So you want to listen to the cynics. They are very valuable people. Listen to what they are saying, listen to what they believe are wrong because they are reflecting a large proportion of the people who are not saying anything. Help get them to help you identify the approach if they think it's not going to work. Listen to them, respond, adapt and adopt the solutions in that order. So if we are going to change, if I'm going to move from where we are to where we want to be, I first need to identify what is the current status and what is the desired status. And once I have those two, I can start seeing a direction that I might want to work in. So I can start putting in place, identifying the main steps or thresholds that I want to achieve in order to move towards my desired states. And then of course, I will continuously monitor and control that. Start from where you are, but understand what the end point is going to be like, because uh, these are two buildings that were built within a few years of each other. Uh, one is Bauhaus, one is Art Nouveau. They are both brilliant in their own way. They are both part of the history of architecture. But if you don't have an understanding of what it is to start with, you're going to fail. So if we're talking about changing the culture, I'm going to ask you, what culture do you expect to be? Because there are lots of characteristics of culture and a lot of them are contradictory. So you will have, uh, you might want rule breakers who are going to invent new ways of doing things, or you might want uh, people who follow the rules and obey the rules. You might want, people who are respectful of the past, or you might want people who are focused on the future. And so I'm going to ask you now, um, everyone, yeah, sharing to everyone the uh, a link to a Miro board. And so the idea of the Miro board is that you have got a whiteboard, and I'm hoping this is sharing properly the way I want it to. Yes, okay. Uh, you've got a whiteboard with post-it notes on it. If you follow the link in the chat, you will have access to it. And I'm going to ask you to start listing what are the cultural aspects you would like to see arriving in your business. 
So you've got on the board a number of post-it notes. You can select them. You can type into them. If you start typing into one of the post-it notes, the font will change to fit in. So you don't have to worry about that. I will remove that because we don't want at this point. You can uh, move the post-it notes about if you want, and you can create new notes if you want to by uh, using the little note icon on the left. So go in here, we're now in full workshop mode and start filling in what are the things you believe you would want to see coming out. You'll notice on the board, there's a light gray square. I would ask you to stay within that square. It makes it easier to share this, the results afterwards with you. So far, I am not seeing anybody. The link asks to create a Miro account. It should not ask to create a Miro account. Um, Anyone with the link can edit. Copy board link. Okay. Repaste it. I think, Peter, the problem is that some of us have Miro accounts already through work. So, and, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to locate your board in my Miro application where I'm so logged there in. Is, there is the updated link which should allow everybody to have edit facilities. Okay. It's exactly the same as before. Okay. I've got some guests here. So I'm gathering I've got some people who don't have an account. That's good. So you can see the cursors of the other participants. Select a post it note, click on it, and you can double click on it to uh, write something. Okay, double click on the note and it will allow you to type. The question is, what cultural aspects do you believe are important for your business and you would like to see as part of the outcome? So I'll put back up the slide so that you can see it on the... Um... Fail fast, enhance trust and creativity. Um, Rob, have you managed to get on? Okay. Uh, anyone with the link can edit. You shouldn't have to create something. Yeah, I've managed to get into it. Now that, that, now that I've signed up to my company account, I can open the board. It's fine. So what have I got? Willingness to allow the exploration of new ideas. So you can Click on the sticky note option on the right and create new ones if you, they're not available. Willingness to invest in training, willingness to take risk. 
accepting a 50% failure rate, people's safety, fail fast, prepared to experiment, question assumptions, enhance trust, trust our people, failure is expected and we build on it, willingness to take personal responsibility for decisions. Ooh, someone's making their post-it very small there. Paymasters require perfection in our accounts. That's bad for creativity, yes. Question assumptions. Someone drew a smiley face, good for you. <laughs> it's not actually a smiley face, is it? It's kind of a confused face. Respect for the dissidents. These are good items. Um, I'm going to come back now. We're going to build on this as we progress. The next step is obviously to find out where you are today. What is the basis? What are the things that we are trying to achieve? So during organizational therapy, I conduct a number of confidential interviews with every level of the organization from senior management down to the bottom level as much as I can get in order to find out what are the things that are frustrating you? What are the things that you like within the business? What are the things that you dislike? What are the problems you are having? And I try to get the people who normally don't express their opinions to speak up and express themselves, okay? The ones who are at the front, the ones who are actually doing, building the widgets, writing the code that your customers want, what are they actually frustrated about? And we try to identify both the negatives and the positives. So I want to find out what are the things that are frustrating you? What are the things that are annoying you? What is redundant? What is missing? What are the errors and mistakes? But also, if we are going to change the culture, what is it you don't want me to break or lose? And so we're going to come back to the Myra, Myra board and I am going to move over to the next one. And I'm going to ask you here to identify, oops, not that. I'm going to ask you to identify what are the elements that are creating problems. So the pinkish post-it notes on the left will be the things that are creating problems for you. The green ones are the things you don't want to break, you don't want to lose. So you've talked about the future. Now we're talking about the things you want to get rid of and the things you want to protect within your existing organization. So some of our clients insist on using managed desktops. We can't release more than once every two weeks. Concerns for staff welfare and mental health is something good that should be kept, yes. Remote working has caused disconnection. Secrecy, that's always annoying when People don't want to tell you what are the issues, what is happening, what's going on. We need to find a way to overcome that. One way is law. Lack of direction and clarity. Monthly town hall meetings. Yeah, that's a positive thing. Uh, 
I remember one of the companies I worked for, they did a monthly meetings and the CEO would reward one person for the best rumor brought to his attention. And so the whole idea was when you heard a rumor, you would contact the CEO, tell them about it. And possibly he thought this was the most useful one you would explain it, get rid of the rumor, which are expensive and take up a lot of time and reward you with a company jacket or something exciting like that. Skills and opportunities database. Okay. Keeping an eye on time, I'm going to move on to the next phase of this. So we talked earlier on that this was complex and that it required psychology and sociology and not just pushing things around. You have to understand that culture is something in which you are embedded. It's something that comes from the bottom. You cannot force the culture change. You cannot create the culture. You can influence it. You can try to adapt it. So we're going to try to find the things that constrain the culture positively or negatively, try to strengthen the ones that encourage what we want and try to reduce, weaken, discourage the constraints that are helping people have the wrong attitude. So an example of that is one I did a few years ago. Um, this, this is a picture of a whiteboard. It took me about half an hour to build it up, just brainstorming with myself. Um, staff motivation was the question. So to the left of this, I have got all the things, the constraints that are creating poor staff motivation. And to the right of it, I have put what is the possible ways of fixing it, of making things better. Then I identified how can I influence those constraints and outcomes so that I've got the full picture of what I'm trying to achieve. So the next phase that I'm going to ask you to look at is to just list what are the cultural constraints that you are aware of that have an impact on where you are and where you want to get. Now, don't pay too much attention to my graphic here. Not all the links are reasonable or realistic. I just wanted to make a something that looked reasonable. So we're going to come back to the Miro board and move into the next one where we identify the constraints. So at this point, I'm not asking you to tell me what characteristic this is a constraint for, just what are the constraints, positive or negative. High priority, isn't everything always high priority? People need to know what they want to achieve. We've got some overlap in these, haven't we? There was communication problem earlier on. There was secrecy. Search for perfection. Oh, unwillingness to make mistakes. That's one that really upsets me. If you can't make mistakes, you can't learn. Making mistakes is all about learning.
So um, I guess those of you who have got a Miro account, you can probably continue working on this later. But um, I will I will send you a copy of the boards with all the information on them. So once you've got this list of um, constraints, the next question is, what can you do about them? Some of these constraints you can impact. This falls under your responsibility and authority. This is something you can do about. Some of them you can influence. You might not be able to do it directly, but you know who to speak to. You can talk them into it. You can influence someone to make it happen. Some things you really can't do much about, but you have to keep an eye on. You have to keep your interest level going. And some of them you just basically should ignore, okay? There's not much you can do about them. And once you have identified this, so you're going to have a look at what you can impact, what you can influence, what you need to keep interest inf informed about, what are the items that you can ignore and make sure that the goal is reasonably positioned. The ignore bit we're going to throw away, we don't need that. So we're going to focus on the three that matter, impact, influence, and interest. And you're going to go back and have a look at your uh, list of uh, constraints and identify which ones you can impact, which ones you can influence, and which ones you have to keep an eye on and keep interested in. So we go back here to our board and we move into the next page, which is here. And I'm going to ask you to identify what are the constraints? What can you impact? What can you influence? What are you, should you keep informed about? And what can you ignore? So if we choose one, start identifying what are the various aspects? What are the things that you want to do? And where should your priorities be? So you can drag over some of your constraints from the left, or you can repeat them. Okay, maintaining the public image. How can you, what can you do for the maintaining the public image? What can you impact influence? So moving on, I'm keeping an eye on the time and it's going fast. We've now got what we want to achieve. We got what are the things we can impact influence so we can uh, start putting them together. Um, very quick overview of the theory of constraints. We've identified the system's constraints We've had a first approach through the influence and so on um, as to how to decide what, how to exploit them, what can be done about them, prioritize what are the things you can impact directly, what are the next things you should be working on, elevate the system constraints, so improve the ones that are um, potentially 
facilitating the cultural aspects you want and removing the ones that are creating problems. And if you do solve a constraint, go back to step one because there are new constraints to be identified. The approach into making all this happen, it's well known, it's traditional, we've all referenced it, I'm sure, at some point. So we've got Sherwood's cyclical concept of specification product inspection, which led um, Deming to create his wheel of design the product, make the product and test in production, sell the product, test the product in service. That was translated by somebody in Japan as plan, do, check, act. And then Deming improved it for learning and improvement saying, plan, do, study, act. That has later been adapted into the SAPDU approach, which is my favorite approach because it has added to the Deming cycle a specific step for uh, determining goals and targets before you start planning and before you start doing the work engage in education and training. Different terms can be thrown in in order to help understand it. Most companies unfortunately still use the Nike approach, which means we don't plan and we rarely get results. So that is discouraged. So determine your goals and targets by clearly explaining what it is you mean quantify your objectives. If I say I want a client first culture, what does that mean? How does that reflect in reality? I want to try to understand why you are doing things, why are you changing things? And put that in relationship between what you want to do and what you expect as an outcome. Okay, the job to be done principle is fairly straightforward understanding why people would buy this. Okay, people are not interested really in the titanium hardware of a skateboard, they're interested in the fun they're going to get out of the skateboard. Translating this information, these objectives into something quantifiable so that you can help understand it. Um, this is a uh, example created with uh, Tom Gilb on how to measure and establish cultural tolerance. I strongly recommend the two books here, Tom Gilb's uh, Competitive Engineering and um, Hubbard's how to measure, I was going to say Ron Hubbard, it isn't Ron, of course, um, but Ed, I can't remember his first name and I can't read it on the slide, okay. Hubbard's how to measure anything, which are uh, fascinating in order to identify what to do. When you're thinking about measuring culture, these are some of the things that you should be considering. What does it actually mean? Because of the time, it's 10 to 8, I am going to skip the next exercise, but it is basically taking the constraints you have identified and trying to identify how can I measure this? How do I measure the cost of a loss of reputation? How can I measure the value of a reduced timeline? So how can I, oh, that's nice. Tom has just put a link to competitive engineering in PDF format. Uh, um, Tom is more generous with his books than uh, his editor wants him to be, I think, but that's okay. Um, so identify how you would measure things and then start designing the outcome. How are you going to make this happen? Um, designing is bringing together your concepts, what you would like to see as outcome, and the technical aspect of how it's going to be. In other words, I'm going to actually start really creating 
an action plan here where I am clearly stipulating what it is that we're going to do, how much we're willing to invest, what we hope to get out of this, how we're going to know when it is done. Designing for me remains a perpetual spiral. So you're not going to do this once, you're going to do this on an ongoing basis with a number of repeated steps. You're first going to conceptualize what it is, diverge, or question that what you want to do, find the different possibilities, the different options, challenge them, critique them, prove it's not wrong. Use the scientific approach, okay? Science very rarely proves anything. The purpose of science is to disprove things. So prove that it doesn't work so that you can throw it out. Identify the risks so that you can start prioritizing what it is you're trying to achieve and then start planning how you're going to do it and build your approach. Start doing it, start converging again. Control, check the outcome, analyze the results, check the progress made, identify where you are, and start the whole process over again, again, and again, and again, until everything is in place. Changing the culture, stimulate conversation. People have to tell you what needs changing. You need to coordinate and align. You might have several people trying to change a different constraint at the same time. They have to work together. Your messages, your activities, your behaviors have to match up. If you've got senior management saying something and doing the opposite, it is immediately visible and it will be thrown out. They lose all credibility, okay? Listen to the septics, listen to the critics. They are telling you what problems are going to come up and what you need to understand. Respect the existing culture. You are working with intelligent people who know their job, who know how to do it, respect that. Let them give their own opinion on these things, okay? Ask them how to improve things, what needs changing. Focus on the people, okay? Work within the culture and make sure you can judge ideas and issues based on their organizational value and not just based on the person who delivered it. The person cleaning the offices at night might actually have a very good idea that will benefit the whole organization because it covers everything. When we are talking about culture, it is at every level of the organization in every aspect of the organization. And you need to understand that and you need to do it yourself. You are the culture. It's not just other people who need to change. If you are not willing to change the way you do things, you cannot expect others to change the way they do things. Do it, prove it, make it happen, accept your responsibility. If you're at a management level, consider what your role is. It's not to manage, it's not to bully people, it's not to dictate what has to happen or should happen or should not happen. It might not even be to motivate. The role of the manager is to satisfy the innate desire people have to take pride in the value of their work. If your people are not taking pride in their work, you have missed something critically important. So work on that, make sure people can get pride in their work. And that is where I will finish for today. Um,
don't know if there were any questions. There were no questions in Menti, so I can close that screen. That's a good thing. Any questions? It's time to unmute yourself, to come on board, to give me any questions you want. Um, if you would like to discuss this further, you can go to the bit.ly, uh, okay, let's talk or scan the um, coffee cup there. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm happy to meet up with you. Uh, before I do leave you, I am going to ask you one thing, and that is to please give me feedback. I believe feedback is critically important. So you can go to bit.ly, okay, feedback, or scan the QR code here and give me feedback. And if you give me feedback within the next 24 hours, I will give you the option for one free day consultancy. You don't have to take it. It's just there for grabs. Peter, that's an awfully generous offer. Thank you so much for making that. Uh, I've enjoyed this evening's talk. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I'm going to have to watch the video again. Hopefully it'll have been recorded to the cloud. Um, I have one question for you, and that is um, a lot of what you've told us about is basically from the standpoint of somebody who's a change agent within an organization. Um, no. Many of us, many of us are, are kind of members. Someone who can influence the change. Whatever your position, you can influence the change. There's quite a lot of work involved. You know, most of us are, are paid to do a particular role in a, in a team and, and this kind of stuff. Yep goes way outside. How would you how would you justify that? Uh, if it was easy, it wouldn't be fun. No, no, easy game, no easy game is fun. Okay, I know it's challenging. I know it's difficult. But that is why you, you work your way down to the constraints, you decide what is the minimum you can do. And you work from there. And so, right, if I want to influence this constraint, what are the things that I could do, should do? Um, how can I make a little bit of difference? There is something I have uh, encouraged in a number of companies as a consultant, which I called the um, improvement by contagion. So get a small team to do it the right way. Get a small team to do things so that everybody looks at them and thinks, oh, wow, I like what they're doing. I don't know what they've done that's different, but whatever it is, I want it. And just step by step, impress other people, impress your management that in your team, you are more efficient and more effective than anybody else. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Um, please, uh, um, we've got 25 people left on the line. Uh, do ask a question. Fine, you can unmute yourselves. I'm sure I've got some very opinionated people here. Be more radical. Absolutely. I love that statement, John. Be radical. Okay. If expression I've always heard that, but what I can do, it's just a drop in the ocean. And it's an expression that's always bothered me because the response I usually give is imagine what the ocean would be like with no drops in it. Every drop in the ocean is important. So I guess nobody has questions. A few people have understood it. A few people have left discouraged. Few people are asleep in front of their screen and have their camera turned off so that nobody realizes it. 
but I guess uh, it's one minute past eight. Is this time to wrap up, Emil? I can ask one if uh, oh, we'll bring to light. Uh, hi, Emo. Thank you. Um, this afternoon, I heard I'm, uh, I'm in London. BBC Radio Four had a program, and I apologize. I'm like sideline, or uh, it's how some people do things differently than the the usual expectations. Mm -hmm. And they gave an example of a Danish football manager who was eventually selected after others uh, uh, didn't accept the post. And he transformed the whole team to be able to win the Danish football cup, Euro cup some years back. Uh, he got no credit for it. He was not recognized as, uh, you know, a full forward linking, forward thinking thing. But one statement that came out, which seemed to be the opposite of what was just said, though I think all ways are inclusive, no way, no, I think exclusive. Uh, and he, for example, there was a stage of the game when he took out his leading player, he took the leading player out and put in someone of, of, of who was not leading, and that person immediately made a goal. <laughs> and so his focus was on how to build a team and in effect to not allow that super superior person to be seen to be taking the limelight all the time. Uh, and, it, and then that way he made yes. it. Yeah, but that but that superior person, I guess it depends on what their quality is, uh, because on the one hand, you have like do the radical thing, do something different. Right. So I guess it depends on how you define that, what it is that makes that one person different from anyone else. And some people will make get jealous of that person. Right. And this, they might want to quash him or her. There, there, there was, there was, and uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the names. Maybe someone here can remember. The, I believe it was a basketball team in the States where the new trainer decided to measure different aspects of students that apparently had nothing to do with basketball. And basically what they found out was there were a number of characteristics of the young player who would become a champion. And so instead of picking out the champions who had already reached their peak early in their career, he was picking out kids from school who were going to be champions because we'd identified that already. Okay. And when he did this, he was largely ridiculed. Um, it was largely told that he was complete lunatic to try this. And he built up the best team and every other team started using his formula in order to hire the right people. So I'm, I'm trying to the remember same. the story. It's, yeah, yeah. It sounds it's, the same process, yeah. Yes, it's be, be different. I mean, that's, that's, that's what creativity is about. Uh, some of the best companies that I have worked with who really done something often had a half day to do your own thing and just implemented within the organization and said, okay, look, every Wednesday afternoon, forget your job, do your own thing. And people started developing their own little tools and little applications and they started working because it was a computer society obviously they were all geeky nerds who wanted to develop more things but they came up with brilliant solutions they came up with answers and um, i actually did this illicitly many years ago when i thought that the um, security system on my account. I was working on the software accounting system for Levi Strauss throughout all of Europe. And I'm talking here 40 years ago. And I decided the security is really not good on this. Uh, it's too easy for people to break in. 
And so I started developing my own little security thing after five o'clock, more or less in my own time, just for the fun of it. And because I wanted to practice using uh, my Fortran and assembly languages, that's how old I am, yes. And uh, build it up. And then one day someone came and said, we need to revamp the security on this. And I said, yep, yeah, here it is. Let's yeah. put it in, okay? Right. Encourage people. I want to answer yeah. John's question in the chat here. Is it easier to change commercial or government organizations? Um, I, I'm going to speak from my heart here and say it's easier to change commercial organizations because commercial organizations are usually led by intelligent people. Um, Ooh. But maybe that's just my opinion of politicians. The problem with politicians is they want to appear to do something rather than do something. Politicians generally are uh, very short term and they need to do something that will allow them to get reelected in four or five or six years time. And they don't really care what happens after that. So they will make long-term promises. Uh, we're seeing it right now in a number of countries where we are promising that we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. And the politician promising this is knowing that he will be long gone on full salary pension before then, and it won't be his problem when it doesn't happen. Okay, so that's the problem with politicians. I was working years ago, I was talking to, actually, I believe Tom was in that meeting, talking to some people from the um, uh, British, I uh, think it was Immigration Frontier. And they were being told by their political leaders that they have to work according to agile principles. I said to them, okay, um, wh what's the problem? And they said, well, we're not allowed to see our end users. We receive all the requirements up front. We have to give them a fixed estimate of when this is going to be ready, how long it's going to take, what it's going to cost. And we cannot deviate from that. And we cannot have any changes implemented once the requirements have been handed over. How do we apply agile to this? My question was, do you believe that they have any idea what agile means? And they said, no, of course they don't. So I said, okay, well, continue working in a waterfall model that's much better adapted to what you're busy doing and produce regular progress reports using agile terminology to please them. <laughs> and that was sufficient, okay? It's very difficult. Um, I was working with... Uh, a finance ministry of finance in another country which i will not name one of my colleagues was there and had told me they had been given he'd been given um i think it was 18 months to rationalize the approach and the processes being used I started talking to these people and I went back to my colleague friend and I said, forget the 18 months, you're going to need a minimum of 18 years to make this happen. These people were paid to be at work. At 4.30, the workday was finished and they dropped whatever they were doing at 4.30 on the dot and walked out of the place, it was no longer their problem. They would get promotions and raises in salary based on how many years they had been working in the ministry, not based on their competency or anything like that. How do you want to improve this? There's no creativity, they don't care. Anyway, I'll move away from politicians. I believe someone has corrected my uh, story. 
with a football story or has added to it, okay. Any other questions? No, I think, up I think or forever hold your natural end. Um, DJ, it's been absolutely fascinating, as, as was your talk on the truth and quality back in January. So I'm very pleased that you came back and did this again. Um, and I'm so pleased to see Tom Gill here as well. Um, and indeed everybody else uh, who, who joined us. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Margaret, for making it a joint meeting with the uh, software quality. And thank you, Sohair, who's uh, now joined the call sometime partway through um, on behalf of the uh, business change specialist group. Uh, I think our next meeting is going to be in four weeks time. And I very much look forward to that one. It's a very much more technical meeting um, regarding the uh, OWASP open source um, API gateway. And uh, I'm going to see what's, what that's all about. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording here. And um, I mean, if people want to stay on and, and talk on the Zoom conference, they're very welcome to do so. But I'm going to drop off shortly. Thank you.